Hey there, today we're gonna take a look at a Chris Potter solo, a solo over All the Things You Are. And I heard this solo, it's from a YouTube video I found where he's playing with this other musician, pianist Shai Maestro. Not sure if that is the correct pronunciation, I might be butchering his name, but uh, I find it pretty funny that he's a great musician and his last name is Maestro. Anyway, so here they're playing All the Things You Are, and have you ever had that feeling that you sometimes you hear a solo or something and you just know that you have to transcribe it? You just have to know, figure out what is going on. So that, the, that was the feeling I had when I heard this. So I have lifted the two first choruses and we're going to take a look at that and see if, what's going on here and is there anything we can learn from this. So let's just get right into it. So I have the solo here. I slowed it down a little bit in transcribe. It's kind of hard to hear where the solo or the form starts. So I'll give you the one. And then Chris's solo starts on the pickup into the second chord. One. Okay, so there it is. And before I get into it more, I'm gonna play it over a regular backing track, like a, that just one of those play alongs I got off the internet. And hopefully that will demonstrate that this might sound like they're doing a lot of crazy stuff. When I heard it, I thought that they were playing all this advanced stuff. And in a way they're playing on a very advanced level but not in terms of the note choices or scales choices or anything like that, really. It's kind of straightforward what he's playing. It's more about how Shai is comping, I think, and the, the rhythmic kind of freedom they have. So I'll, just to prove my point, I'll play the same solo over a, just a regular backing track, and you, you'll hear that it's not that strange when you hear it in this context.
right, so I messed up a little bit here and there. So the big difference between what I just did there and the previous example is obviously in the comping. So here we have just kind of regular straight ahead. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with straight ahead jazz and comping like that, but that's not what Shai is doing. I think what he's doing, I haven't analyzed his playing in detail, but he's using a lot of pedals and they're very rhythmically, they're kind of pushing the rhythms and playing kind of hinting to uh, polyrhythms and stuff like that. But so imagine that you used a lot of pedals, it could sound something like it. solve it to the G, you could treat the whole thing as some kind of D pedal, going to a B pedal. Even the A section, the first part of the tune is in A flat major, right? All those chords belong to A flat major, so you could play some kind of E flat pedal. So I'm not saying that that's exactly what he's doing. Sometimes it sounds like he's just playing like a pedal note. He's kind of playing just one note. And he's kind of being very loose with the rhythm and everything. And they obviously, he and Chris, they're, res they're responding to each other's playing. They're reacting instantaneously to what the other player is doing, which kind of goes to show the level of that they're playing, right? So I think it's more about that rather than that there isn't really any crazy scale choices or anything like that. And I thought when I heard it that Shai was playing all these weird reharmonizations, but I don't hear a lot of reharm stuff. It's pretty, it's pretty triadic actually. It's a irony that it's more modern to play triads than four part chords. So anyway, that wasn't what I was gonna talk about. I was gonna talk about the Chris's solo. So. Let's look at it. So uh, I'll play it from the top. So first some scales. And here, So first of all, first he's kind of playing a, a hemiola, kind of like a polyrhythm. I guess he's kind of reacting to something uh, Shai is doing. And then he plays this arpeggio over the C major, which is kind of a sus2 arpeggio. Which, that is kind of a more modern thing, you don't hear old Tra traditional jazz players do that. That's something that came later with the modal jazz, right? Even though somebody might say, well, I heard this player play it in the 1930 or something. I don't know. It's to me, it's more of a modern sound. So it's a sus2 arpeggio. Funny thing there is there's no third, right? So when the C major transitions to C minor, he can still use the same motif, which he does. Notice also that he's not starting the phrases on beat one. He's starting on starting on beat one is kind of an am, uh, amateur thing. It's a beginner's mistake, right? So one, two, So there's a little motif there that is able to transition to the next key change to the, or to the next key there. I did see a clinic with him in Toronto and he didn't talk a whole lot about scales and theory 
stuff. You know how some clinicians, they hand out material and they love to talk about concepts like pentatonics over this or hexatonics, this and that. He didn't seem to talk about that at all or think that stuff was not something he would seem to be interested in. He was more talking about other aspects of playing, but he did, however, talk about the importance of being able to take a motif, an idea, and transpose it anywhere. So that's we're going to see later on in the solo that he does that even more. Then we're getting into the first two five there. To the G, and he's playing this. Again, there's a sus arpeggio. So I don't know if he see if he is thinking like two five one in G, or is he maybe he's just thinking some kind of D pedal modal stuff. Again, it doesn't start on beat one. So you got that little, little very simple motif. Right? But the thing with those motif, motific ideas is that the simpler the better. Then he gets into a new idea. Now we have this part of the tune, which I think is the trickiest part of the tune. D flat major, D flat minor, C minor, B diminished, B flat minor, E flat to A flat, to G, C altered, and then it starts over. So, there he goes into kind of a connecting licks, I think. So, Okay, so first off, over the D flat, it doesn't play anything. D flat minor. Something that is kind of hitting to a dim symmetrical diminished sound. Something like Michael Brecker would play. Then he plays this. Surrounding the A flat. But it's a C minor, you say, well, that chord could actually be... C minor here could actually be an A flat over C. So maybe he's not thinking of it that way. Maybe he's just not thinking kind of a scale run. Lands on the D, the B diminished, goes up the diminished scale. Plays a very diminished sounding pattern. Have like a bebop cliche for those of you who think i show you too much bebop cliches in my videos well chris potter is playing it so then he plays a very nice thing over the a flat major so that's a uh, one of those coltrane pattern things then the arpeggio then he plays this Which is a kind of symmetrical diminished. Again, very Michael Brecker sounding to me. All right, let's listen to that section. can hear that for the next section um, that 
That's the lydia on flat 7. Uh, it's funny how many things I talk about in my videos are showing up in a solo. <laughs> then you can clearly hear Shai is playing some kind of A, which is the sub 5 of the E flat, but he's not playing like an A flat dominant sharp 11, 13, what have you. It's more of like an A major triad sound even. I'm not sure what he's doing, but it sounds very... It's very obvious to uh, sub five. And then Chris is instantly responding to that. Then he's playing this. So again, very simple, it's just chord tones. Over the D flat, he's playing. So. Those are all chord tones, and then just going down to the B for the G7, just playing the triad. And then he's kind of developing that idea in stuff. It could be a thought of as a from the pentatonic scale, right? Again, it kind of goes to show that often when you try to demystify something, you find that. It's very simple. It's, I remember also once I transcribed a Kurt Rosenwinkel solo and I was surprised how simple his stuff, not to diminish those players in any way. On the contrary, that just goes to show how good they are because they make it sound like it's super amazing, complex stuff that they're doing, but it's just chord tone. Then, He plays a chord tone phrase over the C major, continues to the C minor. In and of itself, that sounds kind of like a atonal thing, but it makes total sense over the chords. It's nothing strange about it at all. Then he plays something over the F minor. Uh, That's kind of like a Charlie Parker th thing. It sounds like a bebop cliche. And then over the 2-5 to G. And here they start again for that section start pedaling and he's playing this thing. So I try to demonstrate what it sounds like with the bass notes, like as pedals. You can think of that as some kind of D mixo, so, or you can think of it as like an ostinato melody repeating, and then he's playing a fragment of it. So those are eight notes, right? I mean eight, the number eight notes. And then a fragment of it back and then he that's again what I talked about earlier you need to be able to transpose your idea to the next chord and we're going from like a D mixo right to a B mixo but which is a minor third down but he's going up and he's not playing it exactly the same way he's changing it a little bit which gives you that because if you play an idea too repetitive, too exactly the same all the time, it's going to be very boring to listen to. But he manages to kind of change it just enough so that it's still interesting. But you can, as a listener, you can follow in this um, melodic idea. So let's just listen to it one more time. <laughs> Thank you. 
Notice also how Shai is instantly reacting to this thing and even playing the same thing. And to be able to play at that level, I think it's not enough to, there's no time to think there like, oh, he's playing this. It needs to be happening like a reflex. Like that's how good they are. They can hear something and instantly play play that, right? So then for the next section, he's back into playing more kind of scales and lick stuff. Then triads. So that could be triad coupling, right? I'm not, I don't think he's thinking, oh, I'm playing triad coupling, but it is triad coupling. Some more triads. A D triad, which has nothing to do with the key, just an outside idea, right? Then he's playing the D flat, just triad. Minor. diminished stuff over the diminished chord and then the start of the third chorus is also playing kind of a motif and again you need to be able to play a motif like that and play with the harmony or you can play kind of against the harmony so what have we uh, learned from this? I mean, you could look at it as, you know, I'll, I lifted a couple of choruses and I'll take some of those ideas and use them as licks and try to incorporate it into my own playing, which I do that all the time. But here, it's not so much about that. You have to remember when you're transcribing, one of the reasons why you should transcribe, one of the reasons that I'm doing it is because you're spending a lot of time with the same solo, which means that you kind of get inside that solo or the head of the player, even though that might sound creepy, but you're internalizing the stuff that they're playing, right? So, I mean, not to mention what a great ear training exercise it is to lift solos. You have to really use your ears, right? Which is the most important tool when you're making music, I think. And The thing with these guys, Chris Potter and Shai, is that they're playing on a much higher level than I am. So by listening to them closely and trying to figure out what they're doing and spending time with that solo and playing along, listening, figuring out, some of their musicianship is going to rub off on me, hopefully. That's the idea, right? So it's not so much that I want the licks even though you can look at it like that like some of those licks are great and you could use them yourself but it's more that trying to figure out what they're doing and hopefully that will expand my own musical understanding so that's why i'm doing this and that's why i think you should be transcribing solos as well and with all that i hope you enjoyed it and i'll put the transcription of those two courses on my Patreon page and I shall see you next time.